So maybe at the cosmic scale, when I decide what I decide here isn't going to make a difference um, to how things go. But if one scopes down to kind of to the level of their own lives, to the human scale, um, and kind of centers the lens on their own life, it's really hard not to believe that when you're tossing and turning in the throes of a difficult choice, that there's anything set in stone, that it isn't sort of radically contingent. Um, what you choose, that the future isn't really hanging on, you know, what you're thinking in this moment and what you're going to think in the next moment. In the book, I just wanted to get back in touch with that immediate sense that what happens next in my life is up to me, and to try to come to some understanding both of what that sense is and to see what physics really says about the status of our choices. You know, there's so much we don't know uh, about the world. It's hard to talk about quantum. I mean, one of the one of the things, that, virtues I said of you know taking the problem of free will and putting it in a concrete physical context is that we can then use you know the kind of articulated physical context to try to understand the status of human action. If one moves into quantum mechanics, like, where we we no longer have you know something that we understand well enough to give a realistic model of physical action. The other reason for focusing on the classical case is that um, uh, that's supposed to be the setting in which we have our, our you know, our most, uh, sort of our best example of deterministic theory that looks like it. And that's supposed to be the context within which um, the challenge, you know, to freedom arises. Um, but the, the third thing, and I think this is touching on your question, the third reason is, um, as far as we know, that uh, for things that are as warm and as big and as slow as us, um, the, the Newtonian laws are the effect of physics. The way that, you know, that I think of it, and I think that one should think of it when one is trying to recover kind of, you know, an, a, a physical account of the human being and their place in nature is, um, we sort of, you know, if you think of, of the, the, the architecture of the cosmos, yeah, as having this, you know, having kind of stratigraphic structures. So at the bottom, I mean, where, where you know, the, the, the ordering is a matter of scale. At the bottom there's a microstructure, up here is a macrostructure, and up here there's and then we get to the large scale structure of the universe. The human being arises, uh, you know, somewhere in here, and we can solve, you know, the levels underneath without going right to the bottom. Right. 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 So the space for human. So if we start at the effectively classical level, and we can recover most of what we believe about, including kind of causal structure and temporal mm -hmm. asymmetries and you know agents that intervene, um, then adding new layers of physics underneath isn't good. For Going to affect that, right, right. Um, and nor is kind of the sorts of things that are going to be really important at the large scale structure of right. the universe, so long as they preserve most of the um, kind of the physics of everyday life. Right, and right. that's right. If you're looking at the human being in naturalistic terms, we're of a piece with the fabric of nature, and that what you should do is instead of immediately reifying every aspect of our experience in the environment, is understand how to recover it partly by building up the external infrastructure in the environment, putting an agent in interaction with that environment, with an ongoing mental life that's processing information, organizing information, putting it to use to guide its behavior, mm -hmm. right? and think of the phenomenology as arising, as arising as a product of that coupled interaction between an agent who brings its own, you know, kind of various sorts of asymmetries, asymmetries in what it can intervene, asymmetries in what it can know, um, um, into interaction with an environment. So that that's, you know, so I, yes, I think there's two dimensions. There's the external stuff, and then there's the internal stuff, and then there's the coupled interaction between them, recovering human experience is something that arises in that coupled interaction.
The kind of local causal structure of the world does allow systems, including systems like us, to kind of you know regu systems who regulate the impact of their of the environment on their behavior to have effectively counter predictive ability. You you put me into interaction with anything that thinks it knows what I'm going to do, and I I'll thumb my nose at it, and that ability is perfectly compatible with deterministic with the existence of deterministic laws, and that that kind of thumb your nose at at anything that tries to predict. What, um, what you will do is a good part of what it means to be able to behave spontaneously. So part of why we think we have control over our behavior is this purely engineering sense that we think that when it comes to our voluntary actions, the locus of control of our behavior is our decisions. Um, and sort of um, showing that that kind of thing is compatible with determinism. Um, is an important part of, a, of at least understanding, you know, why this picture of that, you know, there's this kind of wave of necessitation, you know, emanating from the early part of the universe that completely undermines our ability to um, control our own actions is wrong. It's understanding the detailed local causal structure, um, and why it is that a human being who's you know, kind of regulating the impact of, of, of the environment on its own behavior has that kind of control. He's right that a system that knew all, right, all of those things, that sat outside the universe, a kind of transcendent demon, that wasn't forced to reveal its prediction to anything in the universe, would in fact be able to generate predictions of all of that. Right? So the question is, why couldn't there be a thing like that in the world? What bit of knowledge? I mean, that, you know, this whole, for me, it started out as a puzzle. Like, how does one understand physically what's going on here? And it's not as though it's not as though there's something wrong with the determinism because you can just do this in a virtual environment. If I tell you, you know, write down a deterministic computer program that operates in accordance with a, a, a counterpredictive mechanism. Right? Now try to predict what it's going to do. You know, just as you say from the outset, you're not going to be able to do it, and yet it's perfectly deterministic. Right? So what's going on there? What what? What leap have we made from what Laplace correctly said about what determinism entails to the presumption that we ought to be able to predict the behavior of anything, that someone who knew enough could predict what I'm going to do next? Because people make that. They, I mean, imaginatively, they make it, but they also they write that down, right? Determinism entails it. If I only had enough information, I could predict what everyone else was going to do. In fact, I could predict what I was going to do. I would never have to make my own decision. It just doesn't follow. So the, the question is analyzing carefully what's going on there and why it doesn't follow from determinism in the sense that we actually have determinism. If I'm trying to predict an event that's even a fraction of a second in advance, I can't now have enough information. And in fact, that's exactly what's going on with the paradox of predictability, because what's happening here is in the causal process between your revealing your prediction to me and me acting, there's the production of a new event that's causally relevant right. to okay. the action, right? Yeah. That um, to, to, you know, what, what I'm Good, how I'm going to act that you couldn't in principle have known. Mm -hmm. Or if you knew, you wouldn't have been able to fix before mm -hmm. you made the. So that's exa it's exploiting that window, mm -hmm. you know, between the prediction and the event. And that's absolutely key mm -hmm. to the local on the ground causal structure. That's exactly what's going on in you know, kind of the development of the world. It's absolutely true that when I'm acting and I'm looking into my future, right, um, there's nothing in my causal past before my choice that, that normologically fixes those events. Determinism in the form that we actually have it is, is a kind of transcendent vision of a world whose local on the ground causal structure um, is never enough information in the past to fix the future. 
there just isn't. Uh, you know, not not in not in uh, you know not in Newtonian mechanics, not in relativity. Although it's the nice thing about relativity is that's much more clear because there still is a sense in which one wants to say in a Newtonian context, yeah, but you know the total state is fixed before you act. You know? In relativity, in relativity, that's just not right. The kind of nomologically sufficient basis for your future actions is not fixed before you act, because you know there's there's not there's no good sense in which the stuff in the absolute elsewhere objectively happens before you act. So if you're trying to make a prediction at point P, the only things you have access to are things along your light cone. So things um, that a light signal from some point in the past could have reached you or anything moving slower than the speed of light. So if you're trying to predict an event in the future, uh, Q prime, what's going to be, um, so you could, um, a consequence of relativity is that if you take a cross section of the light cone and you take all the information on that cross section, that's sufficient to predict what's going on at point P. Um, but given that you're at point P trying to make a prediction for point P prime in the future, what's going to be relevant is if you're taking that slice, is everything on that slice plus this extra information here, which you don't have access to from point P. In principle, you don't have access to because the speed of light is the yeah. sort of speed limit for signals. So, so it's a nice easy way to see the, in the picture there that you can't predict. I want to put it a little bit differently though because that way makes it sound um, in a way that pe a lot of people are tempted to think that information is there, but, but you just don't have access to it. And the right way to think of this, it's just not fixed. It's no more, more fixed yeah. than your future action. Yeah, so this is from within a particular yeah. drawing thing, from within a particular reference frame. Right, right. Right. Yeah, it's not fixed inside of that um, area. But that's it's a nice sort of yeah. pictorial representation of that. The right way to think of what relativity does is it just it gives you a way of recovering temporal. It makes time endogenous. So now, whenever you talk about different times, you're talking about different points in that in that man in you know in the four-dimensional manifold. And when what you're when you're trying to imagine your ongoing mental life, you have to see yourself as assessing, looking at this four-dimensional manifold from different temporal standpoints as you move up your world line, right? So you have to, what you have to see is, is, is your own point of view on time changing as you get older. You can, you represent your ongoing mental life as looking at a four-dimensional manifold from different temporal standpoints.